Hey everybody, I'm Finn McKenty. I'm the head of the Music and Audio channel here on Creative Live. If you're new to Creative Live, we are the world's best online classroom for creative professionals. Uh, on the Music channel, we have classes about songwriting, engineering, mixing, mastering, all that fun stuff. If you want to check out more, go to creativelive.com slash audio. There's lots of free previews and other stuff to check out, so I encourage you to do that. Uh, Joey, welcome back to Creative Live. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm sorry that you're uh, feeling a little bit under the weather today. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, that's okay. Everybody gets sick sometime. Well, I know, uh, <laughs> I know in addition to having some bands in the studio, you've got a lot of other stuff going on. Uh, one of the things that you launched recently is the Joey Sturgis Forum podcast. Uh, do you want to tell folks a little bit about that and, uh, and, and where they can find out more? Sure. Yeah. Um, the website is jsfpodcast.com. And basically what we do is we get together four to five times a, a month and um, talk about anything from, you know, how to be a better band to how to be a better produ producer. Um, so the show's kind of geared not just towards producers and engineers, but it's also geared towards uh, uh, musicians, artists, and even, you know, managers and, and people who want to get into music business as well. Uh, we talk a lot about entrepreneurship too and um, it's just a cool show where me and some of my best friends get together and just give advice based on our experiences that we've had in the last 10 years. Cool and you also launched Menace recently, right? Yeah, Tone Forge Menace is out right now. Um, we're still in our soft launch phase, but you can buy it and use it. And we have a lot of really positive feedback so far. Uh, we're working on the next model and also working on some examples uh, to show, you know, what it sounds like. So Menace is your own uh, amp and cab sim. Um, and that's joeysturgistones.com is where people find out more about that, right? Yep, absolutely. Cool. Well, we got a lot of questions coming in, so let's just get into that. Um, okay. And here is a good one. Uh, is uh, What was it like working with Conquer Divide? Uh, that was interesting because um, I'm very close to one of the members in the band. I'm actually dating her. Um, <laughs> so... It, it has been a little bit of a challenge in, in a lot of different ways to work with one of your significant others and, uh, you know, facing day-to-day uh, -day problems in your relationship and also the problems that you encounter when you're doing a record. So um, other that aside, though, uh, it was also interesting to work with all girls. Um, it's not something that I'm very used to. Uh, you know, you have to be a little bit more sensitive um, when it comes to relaying ideas and uh, shooting down parts and, and things like that. So um, all, over, overall, though, uh, I'm really proud of the record. We worked on it for two years. Um, one year of that was spent finding different people from all over the world. We were interviewing people um, using YouTube uh, and doing, you know, tryouts and flying people around and it was, it was really interesting, really fun, and uh, I think everyone should check out the record if you want to hear what an all-girl metal band sounds like. <laughs> uh, well, you, 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 you get exposed to a lot of uh, unsigned bands, uh, and we've got someone that is asking, what makes an unsigned band stand out to you? Uh, I still feel like there's a lot of unsigned bands out there that aren't... Um, they're not doing all, everything they need to be doing. Like you'll have some bands that have uh, some good songs, but then their social media presence is basically nothing, or they have really great social media presence, but they don't have any good songs. Um, so there's always just a couple pieces of the puzzle missing, uh, I find, in most unsigned bands. But what really stands out to me is when somebody, I can tell when somebody has gone through and put the effort forward to take care of you know, good songwriting, uh, good image, having good video content, um, strong social media presence, uh, you know, not, I think there's also sort of a, a way of handling yourself online that I don't see every band doing. Uh, there's other bands that definitely 
do it better than others. Um, and I think the most important aspect really to everything is the live performance. Um, if you don't sound good live, then you're not going to survive. You might have a great album and people might get into it for a while, but as soon as they go, you know, you show up in their town and you go see them live and they don't perform well, you're not going to stick around as a fan. Uh, got a question about plugins. What's your thought on third party plugins versus stock plugins in your DAW? Do you think it's possible to get great mixes that are comparable to any pro mixes with stock DAW plugins? Uh, yeah, I think you can go pretty far with stock plugins. In fact, I use a lot of stock plugins in my in my mixes and in my productions. Um, it's all a matter of personal taste, you know. Whatever you, if you like a stock plugin, then use it. There's nothing wrong with using it. It's just a tool. Um, however, I do think that you know there is a, a place for these third-party plugins, and there's not a single mix that I've done that doesn't have those plugins in there, but I think that you can do a lot with even the most basic tools. It's all about how you use them and not what you have. So I guess for anybody at home that's going, oh, I can't do a great mix because I don't have X number of dollars to buy all these plugins, you would tell them, just work with what you have, you can probably do something great with it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say go as far as you can before you, you know, buy new things. I don't think buying new things is a solution to any of your problems. Um, it's just a, a different way of doing things, or sometimes it's a, uh, a more interesting way to solve those problems, but I would start out with doing as much as you can with the basics. Question from Tarla Chan about guitars. Uh, how did you achieve such awesome guitar sound in Attila's Proving Grounds? The moment when guitars stay alone in the mix, they sound so huge. Is it a boost in the low end, and is it an amp sim or a real amp? Um, pretty much every production I do is usually based on amp simulators, especially now that I'm actually making my own amp simulators. So there's a lot of experimentation happening in, in my mixes and my productions. Um, and the reason why it sounds so huge is just uh, really goes back to paying attention to detail. Um, you know, listening to every single string and listening to the harmonization of each string in the chord and making sure that what you capture is that huge sounding chord that you want to hear. And then the tone itself, you know, of course, I have 10 years of hearing and mixing experience behind me when I'm making a tone. So I would say just keep, you know, keep listening to music, keep your mind open, and keep A being stuff. And eventually your ears will get to a point where you can hear once you've gotten the tone that you're looking for, you'll know when to stop. Uh, we've got quite a few questions about um, mastering and mix bus and all that stuff, so I'm going to ask a few of those. Uh, first one uh, is, how do you get such wide mixes? Is any of it in the mastering or is that all in the mix? I would say it comes from the mix. Um, a lot of the way I do my production has to, uh, it, it, it's what makes it happen really it's it's like you know you can mix it one way you can use these wideners and things like that but that's not going to get you there it's all about how you use your takes and how you use your tracks so for example with my rhythm guitars they're panned hard left and hard right and those are going to be the only two things pretty much in the whole production that are hard panned left and right so that's why the guitars sound so wide um, same thing with vocals if I want a vocal part to sound really wide, I'll record multiple takes of it and pan them in different directions. And sometimes I'll also add modulation on each side, which gives me uh, the effect that it's even wider than it really is. Um, but I don't think you really get there with spatial wideners or, or any kind of like um, weird processors like that. I think it just had it's. Yeah, it's, it's all about attention to detail and also um, just having multiple takes of the same thing because the little subtle differences within each take are what makes that sound wider than it really is. Um, another question about uh, mix bus. Do you ever use uh, the clipper on the stereo bus or do you rely mostly on a combination of compression and limiting? Uh, compression and limiting uh, for mastering. 
you can use a combination of different um, clippers in different stages throughout your mix so that you do you, you kind of already hit your mix bus really loud anyway and so you're just kind of leveling off the peaks by that point um, so I think it's a combination of uh, having it already loud in the mix the way that you're treating your mix and then also mastering that in a in a way that isn't going to you know absolutely you don't want to turn it into distortion because it already kind of is distortion so uh, from Giovanni Angel uh, asks what is your experience using analog summing mixers do you find them necessary in the modern metal world um, I don't actually use any analog summing and I've never really gotten the opportunity to play around with it and um, I have a few of my friends that do and I would certainly like to try it sometime um, but unfortunately I don't feel qualified to comment because I've never really had the opportunity to try it. Cool. Um, well, we've got a few questions around the topic of, of kind of building your career as a, as a producer or engineer. Um, so first one, I guess, is, uh, hi, Joey, from your experience, what's the best way to promote yourself as a producer slash recording studio? Well, the, the biggest thing that I think I did in my career was I made sure the experience of working with me was was a very positive um, thing and I made sure that all of the clients that I worked with were extremely happy with the, the end product and I think that speaks more volumes than anything else because people would walk away from working with me and talk about how positive the experience was with other musicians and once you start to do that with a couple of bands that tour with each other, they start to spread the word. And the word of mouth is pretty much the strongest advertising that you could get. Um, so I would just say at the end of the day, it's all, all about having a really good product. And if you're a producer, your product is not only your final mix, but also how you treat artists and how you collaborate with people. Um, you know, having good communication skills and making sure that um, everyone you work with is happy and, and going the extra mile until they are satisfied. And pretty much, I think that will be the best thing you could do. Uh, also, a lot of questions about kick drums. Uh, Miguel Tereso asks, Joey, can you elaborate on how to tune the kick drum uh, to the key of the song, if you do that, and how to make it sit with the bass guitar? Uh, if you are into tuning kick drums to the key of the song, you can do it by using a, uh, basically by duplicating your kick track. And then on one track, the first one, you will do a high pass filter. Um, and then on the second one, you'll do a low pass filter. And then you'll do, uh, what, I, what I do is uh, sample replacement with a sine wave. And then you can um, use ASDR to, uh, you know, basically control the sustain and the decay of how long the sine wave is. Um, and then the sine wave is just tuned to the note. Um, so basically you're separating your kick into two different tones. One is the low end and the other one is the high end. And then you're replacing the low end with the sine wave, which is like a perfect note. And then you're controlling how long that note is. Um, I've done that on a couple records, but I don't do it on every record. Sometimes it sounds unnatural, especially in, I would say, in heavier music. You kind of don't really need to do that. Um, and then as far as getting the bass and the kick to kind of marry each other and blend well together in your mix, it has a lot to do with EQ carving, um, just making sure that there's space for both of them to be heard. You can't have your bass and your kick drum living in 100 hertz. You want to have maybe your kick drum living in the 50 hertz area and your bass in the 100 hertz area or vice versa. Uh, question uh, on one of your recordings that I like a lot too. Uh, for the Fallen Dreams Relentless Kick, how is it so epic? How is that so epic? Well, that is a pretty old school recording for me and it, it, I struggle to remember exactly what I did, but I know at the time I was using um, Drum Kit from Hell, Superior, uh, and this was before they had Superior Drummer. And uh, one of the kicks on there was really cool, um, and I ended up putting it through 
I think it was an SSL E channel uh, Waves plugin, and pretty much that was the secret to the the sound. It was just that one of the kicks that I picked from that library, uh, going through the SSL E channel with some EQ adjustments, and that was it. And and the stuff that you did in the rest of the mix to allow that uh, kick to to shine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it. It's uh, again, it's attention to detail. It's every little movement, um, just making space for it so that it really does punch through and and stand out. Uh, another kick drum question. Hey Joey, I see you use kick ten on a lot of older productions, and I can never make it sound the way that you do. Can you give me some insight on how you mix kick ten specifically? I'm using clipping, but I know that isn't all you do. Uh, yeah, uh, a lot of times. The sounds that I get are the result of lots and lots of EQing, um, and I, when I say lots of EQing, I'm talking about maybe 20 bands of adjustment, um, so maybe two 10 bands stacked on top of each other, and utilizing all 10 bands on each plugin. Um, I kind of go crazy with EQ, so if you're really after some some radical sounds, you have to start getting your ear tuned to doing lots of EQing. And um, I think that comes with experience of just listening to a lot of records and, and having a kind of an inner audio inside your head, knowing like what, what something sounds like right now and what to do to it to get here. Uh, interesting question from Megan. Uh, is there any band or album that you've worked with or on that significantly changed the way you work musically? Oh, I, all the time. Um, I think I learned something from every band, really. It's kind of like the band learns some stuff from me and I learn some stuff from them, um, which is really a beautiful thing about uh, being a producer because uh, I feel like I get uh, I become a stronger producer after every album. Um, so yeah, I mean some bands you know I'll learn little vocal melody tricks, other bands I'll learn rhythm tricks, uh, drum patterns and just all kinds of things that I just absorb like a sponge and try to uh, utilize them when they're appropriate. So no one particular band that you're like, holy shit, after I did that record, everything changed? Um, I would say, it, I mean, when I did the With Roots Above and Branches Below album, I really learned a lot doing that album. Um, that was the first time I kind of made uh, the connection of, of how to like edit vocals, uh, the timing of vocals, and like how to move things around, and, and how to achieve like more powerful kick drum sounds by combining multiple kicks um, in different layers and using those like in different areas of the song to make a like breakdown sound heavier and like just a lot of experimentation um, and I think the band's bar was set so high uh, that it challenged me and that's why I learned what I did because I felt like I needed to just take everything one step further than what I've been doing in the past uh, question from Anuva95, how did you handle pricing when you first began? Um, I pretty much did things for next to nothing until people were willing to pay me more. Uh, I kind of always preach that people should just do as much as they can if they're, if they're really dedicated and they want to learn how to do this for a living. I would say just record anyone that will let you until people are willing to pay you. Um, and then, of course, you get into, you know, what is the cost of biz doing business? You know, how much is your rent? So how many songs, you know, if you want to price it per song, then how many songs do you need to record? And so you just kind of figure it out that way. Uh, I think I started off like maybe $100 a song um, until people were willing to pay, you know, two or $300 a song. And then you set your price at $300 a song and hopefully uh, other people will agree that you're worth that. Uh, quite a few questions about the Great River. Uh, this one from Lucas Toledo. I know you use your Great River for vocals. Any advice for a cheap pre or is it better to save up and purchase something like the Great River? Uh, especially with vocals, I think the thing that matters most is the preamp and then the microphone. Um, if you have a, a really great microphone but a crappy preamp, it's not going to do you any good. Um, so I would say it's better to have maybe a crappier microphone and a better pre, uh, cause the microphone I use is all, it's like a $400 microphone. Um, 
uh, so I would consider that in the world of of eight thousand dollar microphones that's a pretty crappy microphone but it does the job for me but I'm using a, a more expensive preamp like a one thousand dollar preamp um, and for me I, I feel like it that is really the most important part of it uh, as far as suggestions uh, man the I mean the lowest price preamp that I use is the Great River and that one starts at a thousand bucks um, I would say before Maybe you could just use the built-in preamp on your interface until you can save up enough money to get that. A uh, couple questions about this as well, and I, I would be interested to hear your take on it since you're one of the people that kind of invented it, is uh, where is Metalcore going right now? The sound is obviously evolving, or at least it should. What's the general direction? Well, there's a lot of different directions, um, so it's kind of hard to say what the general direction is. I feel like Metalcore has really kind of um, expanded into a lot of different um, avenues. You have bands like Issues who have an R&B twist on the metalcore, and then you've got other bands that have a little bit more straightforward singing, um, more anthemic type stuff, and then you've got kind of in the middle ground where you've got like uh, better than average singers, but still lots of screaming and stuff. I think in general though, I do see metalcore becoming a little bit more approachable and more accessible to the mass market. Um, you are starting to see a little bit more metalcore on the radio, uh, and I think that'll just continue to progress. Uh, question about guitars here. How important is the DI chain to you when you're recording guitars? What kind of chain do you run the guitar through on its way into the interface? Um, as far as me specifically, I kind of just pride myself on using really quality parts uh, or quality gear. So we're using a, a guitar cable made by Mogami. Um, it's a really nice guitar cable. And then that goes into a Countryman uh, DI box, which is a very high quality DI box. And then that goes into the interface. And we use the Fireface 800, which I consider to be a pretty high quality uh, recording interface as well. So for me, it's just a matter of having gear that I feel like is, is high quality and also trustworthy. Um, and if you compare it to a DI signal from a cheaper interface without a high quality DI box, you can hear the difference. Um, now, I wouldn't say the difference is 50%. It's more like a 5 or 10% difference. So if you feel like you're struggling with your guitar tone, um, buying the things that I mentioned isn't going to get you halfway there. Um, really, it's kind of just for getting you from a great tone to the best tone and not really from a bad tone to a good tone. Well, I actually forgot to totally mention something really important, which is that we just put up uh, a new class with Joey, which is about mixing. It's called the Mixing Master Class. Uh, I encourage everybody to go over to creativelive.com slash audio and sign up for that right now. It's going to be awesome. Uh, and one of the things which I think you're going to cover in that uh, is some automation stuff, which uh, we touch on in this question, which is how do you tackle lead vocal automation? I'm usually just turning down some weird noises that compression brings out and stuff, but I feel like I could be more. What do you do, and is this something that you will be covering in your mixing class? Absolutely. Uh, you are on the right track with that. Um, mixing sometimes isn't just about blending stuff. It's also about removing things you don't want to hear. Uh, lots of little tiny automations, especially in my mixes. I am going that far with it. I am going in and listening to individual notes uh, being sung by the vocalist and hearing tones that I uh, overtones and, and harmonics that I don't want to be there and I'm going through and automating those out. Same thing with the guitars. Um, and that is something that I will cover in my mixing class. Uh, question from Tarla Chan again. What is the main reason that you use Cubase and not Pro Tools or Logic? Um, I pretty much just started out on Cubase because that's what my friend used and um, I got used to it. And as time went on, uh, I just really fell in love with the way it handles everything and the way it works. And then um, once I got a little bit further into my career and had more money to work with, I decided to try a Pro Tools rig. 
Uh, I didn't. I, I spent about two months learning Pro Tools and didn't like it, and went back to Cubase. So for me, um, Cubase just handles everything a little bit differently. The way that you record, the way you edit, the way you mix, it's all completely different than Pro Tools. And I think it's just a personal preference thing. Um, for me, I really feel like, especially with um, the type of work that I do, I feel like uh, Cubase is a stronger program. Um, it has more features that are geared towards doing what I want to do in my head. Uh, when I have an idea in my brain, I can make that idea uh, reality faster in Cubase than I would be able to do it in Pro Tools. Um, so for me, that is the reason why I continue to use it because it just works. But if other people like Logic or Pro Tools or Reaper or whatever, if they're happy with it, then you, you know, whatever works for you. Yeah, I spe especially um, now, where I feel like we are kind of exiting the the industry standard. Um, you know, for a number of years, Pro Tools was like, you know, if you wanted to do this for a living, you had to be on Pro Tools. I don't think that's true anymore. Um, there's more and more people using different programs and doing just fine with it and having successful careers. Uh, so I would say if you are on a DAW and you love it, just stick with it. A uh, couple more uh, marketing career kind of questions here from Alex Robles. What is the best way to charge, by the track or by the hour? Um, it depends on how you want to structure your business. Um, I try to lean on the artist, and I, th I say the artist needs to be creative when they're in the studio. So if, if that's how you really feel and you really believe that, you should not charge the artist by the hour um, because creativity isn't on the clock and never will be. Um, so that's why I like to charge by the song. And I set myself up so that I do have enough time uh, to do the song in the amount of time that I believe it'll take. But if it takes longer, I'm not going to charge the artist more um, because I think that there's just there's power in creativity and not having to, you know, clock in and clock out every day. Would you encourage starting out bands who want to track to rent instruments more appropriate for the sound or tone they're looking for out of their parts? So basically, uh, should you rent instruments? Um, I would say very seldom it would be a rare situation. If, for example, your drum set isn't the best uh, and you know that renting a better drum set will make your recording sound better um, and your producer agrees, which is a very important point. Don't do things that your producer doesn't agree with. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say, yeah, it makes sense. Um, but on the flip side, you might be a guitar player who is very great at playing guitar on your Les Paul, and you think, well, if I rent this PRS, it's going to make my record so much better. And then you get it, and you, dis you discover that playing a PRS is really hard, and now you're not very good at any of your riffs anymore. Um, that wasn't a good idea. So I would say if you think the problem is your instrument, it probably isn't unless it's like something that's just really terrible. <laughs> well, I've told this story many times before, but I always like to tell it is I have a terrible piece of shit Ibanez guitar that I paid about $250 for. And uh, 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 Andrew Wade came through and had to track something for his guitar class. And it was kind of last minute thing late at night. and. He's like, well, this is the only guitar we have available to use. Sorry, you can use mine. Uh, and he recorded something with it that sounds 100 times better than anything I have ever done with it. And uh, it was clear that the problem was not the guitar, it was me. So there you go. There you it's go. It's usually yep. not the guitar. <laughs> uh, question, uh, again, on the, the marketing side of things, what is the most important marketing vision slash career thing that professional bands have in common? Um, I think there is really a strong sense of branding in, in professional bands. Um, for example, if you look at If Mice and Men, they've been doing this seashell thing. Um, and every time you see a seashell, you probably think of If Mice and Men. Um, that's just the, the, you know, somebody decided that was going to be the symbol of their band and they really went for it and that became a branding exercise that worked very well for them. Um, you see a lot of other bands uh, who do like a little play on, on their name using different letters uh, to create some kind of symbol. Um, 
you know, that's that's the kind of things. Those are the kind of things that you need to be thinking about. Um, also, when you play live, uh, you might want to take into consideration that people won't understand your band name if you say it into the microphone. So there might be other ways to convey what your band name is or what your branding is by visual, uh, you know, monikers and things on stage, um, like uh, a symbol that's spray painted on your uh, guitar cab, for example. Those kind of things actually might not seem very important, but they really are. Um, and they're part of the reason why uh, the band will remain in your thoughts um, after you, you know, have listened to them or after you've seen them live. Like back in the 80s when they didn't have uh, the internet, you would, you know, you could name your band The Police or The Who and it made sense, but you would never name your band that now because you can't Google for The Police. Yeah, that's another thing to consider, um, you know, in the age of, of the internet is uh, having strong SEO. Um, you know, if, if you are using a, a, a word that is popular for another reason, it might not be the best band name to use. A uh, question from Miguel Tereso, uh, something I struggle with a lot too. Joey, I feel that low mids are the most troubled area in this style of music. How do you handle them in individual tracks as well as on the master bus to avoid a muddy mix but still retain fullness? Um, yeah, so the problem with this style of music is that a lot of the instruments exist in the same frequency space and they also play the similar chords in the same octave, um, which is basically like piling up a bunch of stuff in one small area that pretty much explains what you're talking about. Um, the trick to it really is just EQ carving and also automation. Um, not everything can have the focal point of the song at the same time. So when the guitar riff needs to be strong, maybe the bass comes back a little bit. When the bass needs to be strong, maybe the guitars come back a little bit. Uh, paying attention to what the song does um, is going to help you with your mix because you're going to make the right moves uh, based on what the song is doing. But the most important thing is having good songwriting will give you a good mix. Uh, somebody who writes a song improperly and has a lot of stuff existing in the same frequency range will basically make it impossible for you to make it sound good. Um, so there has to be kind of a uh, it's not a one-trick thing. It's it's a good song mixed with good songwriting, mixed with um, you know proper placement of, of chords and uh, chord voicings, and you know the bass doing something interesting and not just following the guitars, um, and you know those kind of things all add up. All right, we have time for a couple more questions here. Uh... Question about guitars again. When using an amp simulator, how does pre-EQ differ from post-EQ? If you're using pre-EQ before the amp simulator, then you're basically, um, that, that's kind of acting like an EQ pedal, as if you were, if you had an EQ pedal hooked up to your guitar going, you know, into your guitar amp. Um, I would say that's pretty rare. Uh, I don't find myself doing much pre-EQ on amp simulators. Um, now, there's also the effect of doing EQ after the amp, but before a limiter or before a compressor. Um, that has a different effect than doing it after the limiter or after the compressor. And that will change the way that the compressor or limiter reacts to the signal. Uh, for that, really, you just have to use your ears. There's no right or wrong way. Um, it just all depends on what your goal is. I would say, you know, if you, if you have a guitar sound, and every time you play low notes, it makes the compressor react too quickly, then it might make sense to have a pre-EQ sidechain into the compressor uh, so that the compressor stops looking at the low end as much as the high end, for example. Uh, do you uh, usually, uh, do you do a lot of like compression or anything else on the DI or, or just edit it? Um, for the style of music that I work on mostly, I would say uh, I'm not using a lot of compression on guitars. I'm using a lot of limiters. Um, that's just because it's a little bit more of a static sounding mix or or static sounding tone. Um, but if I was doing like a rock record or maybe a blues record, I would probably use. I would go about it completely different. I wouldn't use limiters at all because you would be destroying the dynamic range, which is a very important part of that style of music. So, 
Uh, this is a really interesting question, which actually kind of reminds me. I, I remember we went out to lunch and you asked me, do you drink? And I, I don't. Uh, so this person asks, how important is alcohol, et cetera, in the business relations field? Let's say you're totally straight edge and don't drink alcohol. Will other bands, producers, et cetera, think you're boring? And will this then, uh, will, will this harm your career? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I would say that this, this very topic is something that still struggle with today. Uh, you know, I don't really party as hard as the other band, as, as most bands do. And uh, I kind of, I mean, I do drink alcohol, um, and alcohol is a very social thing. So it can be nice to connect with artists on that level, uh, especially after, you know, accomplishing something really cool, and you can go out and celebrate. Um, but for me, it kind of stops at alcohol. I don't really do anything else. And that becomes that can become an issue sometimes, especially when the band wants to do that and you don't and you don't want it happening in your house or in your studio. So um, I think the professional thing to do is to just realize that you're not going to ever control everyone and no one is ever going to adopt your ideals, um, especially just for one month. Uh, in the studio, so if if people need to do things and and need to have their own time to do them, then I would say just give them that uh, opportunity. You know, say hey, if you guys want to go out and party or something, um, feel free to do it on Saturday nights and just come back on Sunday or you know whatever works for you. And then as far as like business relationships and uh, meeting different people in the business and stuff, I think most people kind of respect each other. Uh, you know, if 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 one person doesn't drink but the other one does, so be it. You'll you'll be able to coexist. Uh, I bet you have some thoughts on this. When working with a band who is starting out, producing an album with them, would you advise trying to get writer credit on their songs? Uh, for starting out, uh, no. Uh, especially not if you don't have a lawyer. Um, I would wait until you've really established yourself and you've you've had a couple of records that have have done some success to where you have reference points and you can say well I helped write the songs on this record even though I'm not listed as a writer I did help write them and now the record is a success and because of that I would like to collaborate with you uh, you know to write songs with you guys and in order for me to do that I would request some you know some writers percentage and then uh, in that case, you will want a professional uh, lawyer, um, entertainment lawyer, who will understand how to work with the band's management and the band's legal team to get your, you know, to actually get your request. You can't, you're not going to be able to do it yourself. There's way too much legal information involved in doing that. <laughs> All right. One last question. Uh, why do you not? Work, why do you not work with smaller bands now, even if they have the budget? Um, so once you reach the, the point in, the, in my career, um, it starts to become a little bit more important to do records that will succeed uh, because it's for the well-being of, of my career and, and for my continued ability to do this. Um, like. You know, if I if I do a smaller band that just has the money, it it will actually be a negative thing for me because then when royalties roll around the next period, there won't be any because the record wasn't a success, um, and a record is successful for a lot of different reasons, not just because of what the producer does, not just because of what the band does, it has to do with um, a marketing team, uh, you know, proper advertising, the right kind of distribution. Um, all these things are huge in the success of a record and if I get involved in a record that doesn't have the right pieces of the puzzle then for me it becomes a waste of time um, because I've already done 80 albums that have been great so I don't want to do an 81st album that's not going to be just as good as the other 80 if that makes any sense. Makes a lot of sense. Um, well Joey thank you so much for joining us.